An opposition-led protest against rising living costs has taken hold on the streets of Colombo. It is the 15th of March and Ishara Kodikara, chief photojournalist of the Agence France Press, has been on foot all day behind the crowd as they push forward for the first time towards Colface Green. People start climbing the barricades of the imposing sandstone building of the presidential secretariat. He then notices a fire lit on the road bisecting the green and Ishara runs towards it. People carry flaming torches and scream hoarsely, Meva to uttara denna! Give us answers now! Ishara notices a man, his face distorted in anguish, running towards him. In his left hand, he carries two loaves of scorched bread impaled on a stick. The next day, dozens of international papers carry only one photograph of the incident with the headline Sri Lanka is on the brink of collapse. This is part two of the story of Sri Lanka's economic history, a drama in five parts. <laughs> Last week, we learned that the Dutch trading company, the VOC, and its closed trading operation was grating on the nerves of the Candian kings. They then invited a different sort of European to this tiny island. Ceylon was quite the prize for the English East India Company. With blessings from the Candian kings, they mounted a military, economic and diplomatic campaign to secure territorial control of Ceylon almost piece by piece. But first, the paperwork. The British drew up a treaty with the Candians who, as always, financed their campaign. Thus, the British, supported by Ceylonese, advanced on Colombo via land and sea. After a little pressure, the Dutch, already fatigued from 150 years of trying to make money on the island, surrendered on the morning of the 16th of February, 1796. According to the terms of capitulation, the British took over Dutch settlements and several prisoners of war. The British had observed the VOC and knew its flaws. They realized that the Dutch never really had a smooth ride, not just because of their choice to restrict trade to their company until it was too late, but also because the fickle Candian kingdom, high in their protected hills, always managed to subvert their efforts. This gave them two strategic priorities. First, make sure they could access the Candian kingdom, and second, weaken the Candian kingdom. A word on transport. The Dutch had built canals for their riverboats in and around Colombo. But to access the country's interior, the British discovered that they had to pull their cannons along sandy coastlines. Land transport was essential. So, for the first 20 years, the British were mostly concerned about laying down roads and railways to access the hilly hinterland. They would not make the same mistake by allowing a valuable part of the country to be walled off with imposing mountains. Secondly, they needed to neutralize the kingdom's economic power, which it exercised through state monopolies. A state monopoly run by the Candian kingdom looked like this. The royal treasury of Candy compelled farmers to sell, say, Ericanet at fixed prices, which they usually set to licensed traders. These traders were usually the descendants of first millennia Arab merchants. The treasury made money when the goods were sold to the port of Colombo and generated a profit. Supply was strictly controlled via a quota, and the whole trade was controlled by the Savas, officers of the kingdom. Now this was notoriously inefficient. Growers could not get the best prices for their products and traders could not always fulfill orders because of their quotas. Imagine getting an order for 200 pounds of pepper when your quota was just 25. You would lose the order. The Savas also cheated the treasury by diverting supply in times of high demand. Also, the state lost tariff revenue. All this may sound a little familiar. The British took the monopolies apart, but used the most important part of this value chain, the traders and their distribution network. Also, since the descendants of Arabs and Indian Muslim merchants who ran distribution were ethnically different than the mostly Sinhalese growers, this sowed the seed for communal tensions, which the British used to their advantage to divide and rule. With economic resources diverted and easy access to the fortified central highlands, the British sought to acquire full control. On the 10th of March 1815, the Candian Convention was signed. From then on, changes to the country's economy came rapidly. Now the economic game could really begin. 
The British ran a system called mercantilism. Their theory was that raw materials could be sourced from their colonies, finished in England and then re-exported back to the colonies for profit. For this to work, the colony needed to make enough money to afford British manufactured goods. So, how did they make money in Ceylon? If you watched our story on Veerapuranapu, the rebel of Mathale, you would remember that the British wanted to stimulate large-scale plantation agriculture to generate tariff revenues. The principal export was cinnamon, whose price was volatile. As global prices changed with the weather, the availability of labour and geopolitics. But they acquired as much land as possible, then sold it cheaply to private, mostly British growers. And then there were taxes on the locals. We know that the Dutch diverted the grain tax, which was a share of agricultural income owed to the king. But there was also a land tax in lieu of Rajakarya, which was service to the king. The British did the same. Then they started introducing new taxes to try to make up the shortfall. One of Ceylon's earliest known economic historians, Anthony Bertolacci, produced the first set of full economic statistics for the period 1807 to 1817. In it, he describes the many taxes levied by the British, often enacted with violence. We won't go into all of them, as they're covered in our Veera Puranapu story, but one of them was insightful. It was a tax on wearing jewellery, and it was known as a joy tax. But over time, the British administration started investing in Sri Lanka to avoid being totally parasitic. While the island had always cost the British more than they earned since 1802, by 1828, government spending far exceeded its income, which is known as a budget or fiscal deficit. How did this happen? Well, they must have been committed because over 70 years, these astonishing changes were reported to the Royal Asiatic Society from 1815 to 1883. The country was divided into two regions for the purpose of general administration, upcountry and low country. 170 schools were established with 155,000 students. 125 hospitals were built. The number of post offices grew from 6 to 250 and handled 64 million letters a year. The Ceylon Civil Service was established to administrate all matters on the island. The population of Ceylon tripled from 1 million to over 3 million. But the company's biggest feat by far was this. They grew only 400,000 acres of agricultural land tenfold to nearly 5 million acres by 1883. Ceylon was expensive, now running out of support from Britain and needed to be reformed. In 1832, Charles Hay Cameron pleads with his government that Ceylon was the fittest spot in our eastern dominions in which to plant the germ of European civilization. He partners up with the only other person who seems to care, a major William Colebrook, and together they recommend and enact the Cameron Colebrook reforms. The timing was critical, Britain's economy was spiralling and cinnamon production was down. Alternative cash crops were needed and the British turned to coffee. The British had abolished slavery in their West Indian colonies and removed their protective tariffs, so this resulted in a coffee gold rush in Ceylon, which hit boom times and established the roots of modern plantation agriculture. Between 1834 and 1869, in just 35 years, Ceylon's annual exports of coffee grew from £2,600 to nearly £94,000. But labour was an issue. Remember how Britain made money from its colonies? Back home, British manufacturing faced increasingly competitive imports from its colonies. So they fixed low prices for colonial exports and levied high tariffs against India, Japan and China, which enabled them to simultaneously deplete colonial industries while generating revenue. This served to protect their own manufacturing jobs and industries back home, while their colonies had to purchase English goods. They even went as far as to physically destroy equipment like looms in India. This led to a dismantling of Indian industries. The Indian worker, now landless, turned to Ceylon, Malaya and Burma for work. The British were quick to grab this ultra-cheap labour. Mostly men from South India came to Sri Lanka to work on the coffee plantations in a model that bonded them to their recruiters. This was the origin of the upcountry Tamil community, whose livelihoods are still mostly tied to export-oriented plantation even to this day. So, to recap, the British had acquired land and contracted labour cheaply and also introduced an extraordinarily comprehensive system of taxation. This was, in essence, the foundation of their economic system. 
Unsurprisingly, this system diverted resources away from peasants towards the plantation sector, as they were burdened by heavy taxes to be paid on much less cultivable land than before. A few well-meaning governors realized this was unsustainable and tried to create more equity. But as an exporter of a narrow and volatile basket of agricultural commodities like tea, coffee, sugar and cinnamon, whose prices were determined by the global economy, these exports did not provide enough steady income to give the colonial state any room to change things. Exports were one-third of the country's total output and the country ran a trade surplus. But the British also developed infrastructure dramatically and they needed to invest in an administrative class to subdue tensions which arose from what was essentially a parasitic economic system. To modify the gentry, the company allowed aristocrats and officials such as mudaliyas and radalas to own land and enterprises, particularly alcohol enterprises, from which they, of course, extracted excise duties. Major disparities started to emerge between the land-owning wealthy classes and those smallholders who relied on subsistence living. There were also pure labouring classes such as the estate workers whose entire existence was tied to their work on plantations. By the 1920s, the population of Ceylon had swelled to 5 million and GDP per capita reached a high of 80 US dollars. But soon after the Great Depression, Sri Lanka's GDP per capita plunged to $33 in 1932. By 1936, a malaria epidemic ravages the island. The depression has put people out of work and leftists are starting to gain popularity having stepped in to relieve neglect from the colonial state. Seeing the writing on the wall, the British slowly started their retreat. The Ceylon State Council was established with some representation of Ceylonese in government. Fast forward 10 years, Britain has now fought two world wars and is ready to relinquish control of its expensive and troublesome colonies. Using the threat of communism and the impetus to consolidate Britain's finances, a group of mostly Western-educated elites led by a charismatic DSA Nanayaka begins the process of peeling back control over this tiny but important island. So, on the 4th of February 1948, Sri Lanka was granted dominion within the British Commonwealth, which allowed the British some military presence. But the country was politically divided. A powerful left movement built on growing inequalities and an impression that the colonizer was replaced by the Western-educated Ceylonese upper class was gaining momentum and it was a threat to the elite conservatives in power. Ceylon's main economic activity was the export of commercially grown agricultural products, tea which had replaced coffee, rubber and coconut, while the rural economy relied on subsistence farming. Exports pulled in 90% of foreign exchange which was spent mostly on importing food. Ceylon also did not manufacture anything of note. But there were some services like logistics, banking and insurance to serve the export plantation sector. The cracks did not show much when in good times. The upkeep of the 7 million population was manageable. But all these things added up to two glaring problems. Inequality and an unstable, homogeneous economy. Unlike her neighbours, Ceylon's independent struggle was largely non-violent. Education and health had vastly improved. It had an excellent road and railway network and there was a blueprint for a large-scale commercial export industry. And it was one of the most promising new economies on the leaderboard. Let's talk about rice. With a population who ate rice for almost every meal, the grain was a quarter of the country's import spending. In 1942, a welfare scheme had been established rationing and subsidizing rice at a cost to the state. The state offset this cost by taxing the plantation sector. So Ceylon's exports were artificially inflated in order to pass on artificially discounted products to its citizens. This put the country in a weak position if global prices of tea, rubber or coconut dropped or if rice prices increased. If both happened together, the country's economy could be crippled. To inject some post-independence quick wins and also create a more favourable vote bank, Senanayaka sought to repopulate ancient Rajarata by relocating 250,000 people in what was known as the Gal Oya scheme and also rejuvenate its ancient hydraulic civilization. A large amount of funding was needed for this and other development projects the Ceylonese leadership had in mind. So, in July 1948, Ceylonese government officials requested some help from a leading American economist, John Exter, who served on the Board of Governors of the US Federal Reserve. 
Exeter's report made two recommendations which were later written into the law of the land. The opening words of the law, known as the Monetary Law Act, number 58 of 1949 read, the standard unit of monetary value in Ceylon shall be the Ceylon rupee. A few sentences later, an institution, which shall be known as the Central Bank of Ceylon, is hereby established. On the 29th of August, 1950, Ceylon was among a handful of Asian nations to become a member of the International Monetary Fund. Ceylon now had internationally recognized financial independence and regulation and at the helm of its central bank, its first governor, John Exter. The bank was set up when the government needed to diversify the economy, develop it and bring prosperity to the people, in theory. We have alluded to difficult politics, but here's a recap of what was covered in our story, 1948, Rebirth of a Nation. Collectivist ideology had started to take root in 1893 when the printers of Sri Lanka went on strike and eventually formed one of Asia's first trade unions. But in general, before independence, only a few workers were represented by a union. Then along with the struggle for universal franchise, meaning a right for all legally bound citizens to vote, workers from ports to banks to tea plantations started organizing and securing more rights along the way except for the upcountry Tamils. These rights included incorporating minimum wages across sectors, workers' compensation, holiday leave, pension benefits, instituting labour tribunals, incorporating maternity leave and protection from arbitrary dismissal which enshrined firmly the rights of the employed. And through the Lanka Samasamaja Party and the Communist Party, these ideologies became politically legitimate. What began with the public sector went on to become a powerful set of labour-oriented policies shaping the architecture of Sri Lanka's economy even today. It's 1952 and Ceylon is in a tight spot. Prime Minister D.S. Nanaika has passed away. Then a series of economic shocks. Global rice prices shoot up nearly 40%. The rubber industry is hit. The United States, a huge buyer of Ceylonese rubber, ends its war with Korea. Synthetic rubber has been invented. Demand plummets. India rapidly expands tea production, creating a global surplus and tea prices are in free fall. The government seeks a bridging loan of 50 million US dollars from America, but negotiations fail. Remember that the government provided its citizens with a rice subsidy, but also taxed exports? With nowhere to turn, they had to devalue or weaken the rupee relative to foreign currencies to keep Ceylon's exports affordable. To secure adequate quantities of the country's main food staple, it must find an ally. But its reserves are dwindling and people are starting to starve. Catch us next week on Patta History to find out what happens next as Ceylon faces the toughest challenge of its young independence. A special thanks to our Patreon members for their continued support. To learn more about the benefits of Patreon membership, click on the link in our description box.